Okay, so I guess I'll go for the introduction. Um, like I said, I'm Catherine Varels. I'm a TCAP student here at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and today I'm introducing our speaker for our first seminar this semester. Uh, Dr. Steven Benzinger has been the small grains breeder here at UNL for 26 years, releasing 33 wheat varieties along with several barley and triticale varieties and uh, today um, like you can see on the slides he will be speaking about understanding grain yield so uh, whenever you're ready Steve okay um, and I'll kind of watch the uh, chat to make sure people can are hearing and doing everything fine as, as Catherine mentioned the title of my talk is understanding grain yield it's a journey not a destination and and basically, this is a, a body of research we've been doing since actually the 1980s. So you can see uh, there's quite a number of co-authors that have been involved with the project over time. Okay, let me see now how I page down on this. Oh, wait a second, I, I have to remember over here. And, and what I thought we'd talk about today is the background of the Nebraska Wheat Breeding Program, why we're interested in grain yield, the models used to understand complex traits, how we approach the question, and, and you're going to see that changed over time because technology changed over time, the experimental results, and then what we discovered. Now, the team here is quite large, and, and this is pretty much the current team. In the genetics, there's Bob Graybosch, who's my uh, best colleague basically at the USDARS. Molecular marker work's done with Ishmael Dwycott and Guiwa Bai, or Bay actually, who's with the USDA at, at Kansas State. Um, and then Kulvinder Gill worked with us for a long time, now Deepak Santrum. We have a strong plant pathology group. Uh, we do variety testing. We have one of the, the best transformation groups in the country that works on wheat, Tom Clemente. Very good entomology uh, here is also, and then with um, the USDA down in Kansas again. We do a lot of cropping system research. We've got very good end use quality efforts. We have our own milling and bake lab here. And then one of the strengths of the University of Nebraska happens to be its biometry and statistics department. And a lot of that's now moving into genomic selection, which is a, another time perhaps we'll discuss. Um, we also do modeling and physiology, and that's actually unfortunately getting weaker. Al's retired, but we still work with Greg McMaster. Uh, we do breed more than wheat. We breed triticale, and we also breed winter barley. Our funding sources are, are mainly the Nebraska Wheat Board. Uh, our research and development feeds, we get money from various federal grants and from the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative. And then we've got a collaboration with Bear Crop Science, which is endowed a chair. So there's some additional monies that are coming from a various number of sources. Now, if you wanted to think about what breeding does, I always like to give an impact slide. And this is the University of Nebraska USDA program uh, for 2010. That year we produced in Nebraska about 3.8 3.9 billion pounds of wheat, and its value would be worth just a little bit over half a billion dollars. Now, if you go back and you look at how much of that was due to genetics, so we went back to look at Scout 66 and compared our new cultivars versus our older cultivars, we can say that of that, about 20% was due to genetics. So that meant that of that roughly half a billion dollars in value, we uh, could attribute due to genetics and breeding about a hundred million dollars. Now, as a breeder, I can't take credit for all of that because not all my varieties are grown in Nebraska. So if you look that we had about a 66 percent market share, and that's roughly where we've been for probably the last 10 years, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent, of that hundred and roughly seven million dollars, about 71 million dollars was due to our breeding program. Now, I like making growers money. This is all based on, you know, sales at the farm gate. Doesn't count what adds to the value of trucking and transportation, the milling and the baking and that type of thing. 
But if you want to know what got me into agriculture, quite frankly, I love breeding, but that wasn't what motivated me. What motivated me was if you take that same roughly 3.8, 3.9 billion pounds of wheat, that feeds about 20 million people their annual consumption of wheat using the U.S. diet. So the increase due to genetics is about 4 million, and the increase is due to what the Nebraska Wheat Breeding Program has done, is we feed about 2.7 million people more today than if we weren't here doing our jobs. So that's what, what has me interested in, in breeding. That's what has me interested in working in wheat. And that's why I like working in a crop like wheat as opposed to, say, a, a Arabidopsis or a crop like tobacco. Now, why are we interested in grain yield? Uh, first of all, grain yield is an important trait. It's a complex trait. It involves genes, epistasis, pleiotropism, and it's affected by the environment. And then one of the things you'll discover is that a lot of people who did their research try to work on traits that are much easier to understand. So we felt, you know, as a tenured faculty member, what the heck, you might as well work on something that you're interested in. Uh, and if it's complex, well, that's real life. So we worked with complex traits that do require extensive phenotyping. Now, when you think about grain yield or any truly complex trait, there's re really two genetic models that you can have. One is what I call the infinitesimal model, and that's what quantitative geneticists use. It's a complex trait controlled by many genes spread across the genome. Each gene has roughly the same effect and is small so that it would be hard to find a QTL. What that really says is that you have multiple genes that are indistinguishable. Now, a QTL model is that the complex trait is controlled by fewer genes than the infinitesimal model, and that the genes will have varying effects. They're not, on average, the same size. You know, they don't have that same effect. And really what you're saying is the trait can be mendelized. So you can de develop ways of explaining the genetic variation using, very simply, Mendel's laws. Intuitively, the QTL model makes more sense because that's what we work with. Everything eventually has to be um, a Mendelian gene. The only question is whether you can identify it. And the infinitesimal model says you should not be able to, whereas the QTL model says that you should. So our approach was, we're going to have to use relevant germplasm. I'm not interested in working with germplasm that's unrelated to anything that I work with normally. Um, and grain yield has to be understood in context. I mean, I couldn't do this in spring wheats because I'm in a winter wheat region. Wouldn't want to do it in Chinese spring or a number of other uh, genetic stocks that we could look at. You will have to change your methods as new technologies evolve. And that's you know to be expected in science. You always try to do accurate phenotyping in the breadth and depth that is necessary to understand the environment, the genotype, and the G by E interaction. And that's perhaps more impressed upon us than, than most other states, because you'll discover that the climatic variation in Nebraska, and we'll show this on a map later on if I remember, is as much from Omaha, which is on our eastern border, to Scott's Bluff, which is on our western border, as there is from Omaha all the way to the East Coast. So we are a place that has very, very diverse environments and massive G by E. Okay? And then the other approach is that you work as a team and you, you do your best to attract very good students because virtually all of the research we're going to present here is done by my students or postdocs. Now, when we started, which was in the late 1980s, and the first student that worked on this project was Terry Berkey, there were extremely few molecular markers. The existing molecular markers were mainly between wild relatives and cultivars. So they meant they were pretty much unsuitable to do anything in cultivated wheat. There were extremely good cytogenetic stocks. And Dr. Roslyn Morris, who was a, the cytogeneticist at the University of Nebraska, 
devoted her life to creating reciprocal chromosome substitution lines between two important cultivars. One was Cheyenne and one was Wichita. Now, for us, what you need to know is Cheyenne is the founder line for the Nebraska breeding program. Okay? And its coefficient of parentage was 0 0.16 with Brule and 0.43 with Siouxland. Now, those were the two most popular varieties in the mid-80s. So you can see Cheyenne and the genes at Cheyenne were still relevant to currently widely grown cultivars. In its day, Siouxland was 20% of our acreage and Brule was over 30%. Okay? So we had uh, chromosome substitution lines with material that was directly relevant to our program. Wichita was a very popular cultivar in Kansas, and so it also would be adapted to this area. So what we did, and I'm going to take a minute to look at this slide. I'm not sure. You should be able to see the cursor, I hope. What you have here is this is the um, deviation from Cheyenne's mean for the trait in this case is grain yield. And as you're probably aware, wheat has 21 chromosome pairs. So what Rosalind did is she substituted is chromosome 1A from Wichita substituted and replacing chromosome 1A of Cheyenne. So the other 20 chromosomes are the Cheyenne, but now we've got Wichita in it. Okay? If you look at 3A, you can see it significantly increases yield. 6A significantly increases yield. If you put the Wichita 3B in it, drastically reduced yield in Cheyenne. Okay? Now, if she did this in reciprocal, so she now has the Cheyenne chromosomes in Wichita. And so if you look at chromosome 3A from Cheyenne and you put that into Wichita, it drastically reduced yield. Chromosome 6A drastically reduced yield from Cheyenne when it replaces 6A in Wichita. And if you look at 3B, it had virtually no effect. So what you've done is you've taken the wheat genome and broken it apart chromosome by chromosome so you can see the effect of each chromosome in a common background, and in this case, actually in two common backgrounds. Okay? And what we saw is that if you believe the infinitesimal model, it looks like chromosome 3A and 6A are very important and that there would have to be many, many positive genes on 3A and 6A or many, many negative genes on 3A and 6A in the reverse. And now if you look at the two basically previous slides put together, you can see that Cheyenne, when you replace its chromosome 3A with Wichita's 3A, get about a 15% yield advantage. If you take Wichita and replace its chromosome with Cheyenne. Okay, now what happened with the advance? Are you not seeing that? I'm on slide 13. Sorry, try, um, you gotta try syncing again. Hit the sync button one more time. Okay. There we go. Now we're up to six. Are we up to 13 now? Yep, we're on 13. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, well, I'm going I'm to back up so you can see. This is the, chrom the Cheyenne chromosomes put into Wichita. So you can see how they differed. And here's the summary slide, which hopefully everybody's still seeing, where you can see if you take Wichita 3A and put it in Cheyenne, you get a 15% yield increase. Take Cheyenne 3A, put it in Wichita, which is the red line on the bottom, you get about a 15 to 17 percent yield decrease. If you look at 6A, again, Wichita 6A in Cheyenne, significant yield increase. Wichita, if you put Cheyenne 6A in, significant yield decrease. And then let's take a look at Cheyenne Wichita 3B. What happened here is that Cheyenne's chromosome 3B had its major winter survival genes, okay? 
whereas the um, Wichita chromosome 3B, well, Wichita had different um, winter survival genes in it, so that, in fact, what you're seeing here is that um, when you put Wichita in, it took away the Cheyenne winter survival genes, but when you put Wichita 3B, or when you put Cheyenne into Wichita, it didn't change winter survival because Wichita's winter survival was from other places. Does that make sense? I don't see anybody typing, so hopefully it made sense. Okay. So anyway, this is what you'd call a uniparental thing. Basically, when you substitute Wichita in for Cheyenne, you took away Cheyenne's winter hardiness. But we're really much more interested in the 3A, and that's the one we're going to spend the rest of our time discussing. Going to the next slide, hopefully we've switched. Okay. Yep. What we have here is where you can see the Wichita chromosome in Cheyenne, you can see which ones had a positive effect. That's on the this side. Which ones had a negative effect? So in in um, Wichita chromosome 3A and 6A, positive effect on yield. How do we explain that? Much higher thousand kernel weights. Test weight usually is not really related to yield, but it did have an effect on yield. It also made the plants shorter and made the plants earlier. Now in the Midwest and in a dry land environment, earliness is huge when it comes to yield. So the question is, is that really a yield QTL or is that a earliness QTL that has an epistatic effect or a pleiotropic, I should say, pleiotropic effect on grain yield? We actually think it's a yield per se trait. Why? Because if you look at the grain yield in Wichita, 3A, 6A, from Cheyenne, drastically reduced grain yield. How did it do it? It reduced spikes per square meter. Had a little effect on grain volume weight, but if you notice, it had no effect on anthesis state. So while Cheyenne, the effect going on in Cheyenne may be related to anthesis state, in Wichita, it's unrelated to anthesis state. So it looks like it's not just an earliness gene. Well, okay, so how do we explain the effect? Cheyenne, Wichita, 3A, earlier, shorter, heavier seed, giving you the higher grain yield. 6A, again, earlier, heavier, shorter, heavier seed, giving you the higher grain yield. The Wichita, Cheyenne, 3A, fewer tillers, okay? Wichita, Cheyenne, 6A, fewer tillers. But again, in the Wichita case, no change in anthesis state. That becomes extremely useful in trying to figure out what, what actually had occurred. Okay, so now the question is, how do we go from knowing that chromosomes have an effect to what region the chromosome has an effect in? Because again, we're still not able to truly separate the infinitesimal model from the um, QTL model, because it could be that, that just by happenstance, chromosome 3A has a hundred small effect QTLs on it that are indistinguishable, and we can't really, you know, say that it's not infinitesimal. Or it could be that they have one, two, or three major QTLs on it. Now, it also says that the chromosomes which look neutral could be neutral because they have a beneficial and a deleterious one on the same chromosome, and on average they evened out. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take the lead chromosome, we wanted to break it apart, and we were going to do this using double monosomics, or using monosomics. I'm going to explain that later. The other method you can use is doubled haploids. At the time, the doubled haploid procedures weren't good, but the monosomic procedures in a skilled person's hands were very good. Now, you need to understand that compared to RILs, or recombinant inbred lines, recombinant inbred chromosomes are statistically much more powerful. Fifty recombinant inbred chromosome lines are the equivalent of a population of roughly 200 RILs. 
And it's basically because we've leveled out the background. So if you have just recombination on one chromosome with a uniform background, you can have much more precise measures. Now, how do you go about making these? I presume a lot of people are totally unfamiliar with the uh, cytogenetics, but it's a it's a maybe a lost art, but it's still really cool. So here you have your parent cultivar. In this case, it would be Cheyenne. Here is Cheyenne, where we've substituted in chromosome 3A from Wichita. We make a cross. This is the F1. Crossing over will occur in the 3A. Now, does crossing over occur in the other 20 chromosomes? Absolutely. It's just that nobody cares because the crossover product is the same as the parental line. Okay? So effectively, the only recombination we have is in the chromosome 3A. Now, we take that and we cross it to the female. And the female is a monosomic, from which you will select only the monosomics. Does anybody know why we always use the female as the monosomic parent in this case? I want to see people. OK, I can see Keith is typing. So Keith, why is that? OK, transmission is much higher. In wheat, it's, it's massively higher. OK? Uh, basically, you can use, if you had the monosomic as the male, you would almost only get euploid or 21 chromosome gametes. In the female, you will actually get, and it depends on the chromosome, but you can actually get more monosomics or more 20 chromosome gametes than 21 chromosome gametes. Cytologically, you go in and you select the monosomics. You can either have non-recombinant parents, which is about, it was reasonable. I mean, that just means no crossover occurred. Or you can have crossovers that occurred, which upon selfing, you will get disomic recombinant progeny. And again, you'll also get monosomic ones, but you will do the chromosome counts and select this. Now, what this has done effectively is what a doubled haploid would do. Because there's no recombination in the monosomic, I mean, there's nothing it can cross over with, when you self it, you fix that recombination in one generation. So what we did is by using this, we immortalized the lines so we can now test them. Doubled haploid, same system. In this case, you take the parental cultivar, cross it by the substitution line. You have effective recombination only in 3A, from which you get non-recombinant gametes, or parent lines types, and you will get the disomic progeny, which upon doubling will become basically uh, recombinant inbred chromosome lines that, that are homozygous and true breeding. Now, on this, this just shows you when we put the markers on the types of thing we found. We did find non-recombinants. We did find double recombinants. So those are a little rare. And often when you see that, it makes you wonder, you know, you go back and check your data very carefully to make sure that is truly a double recombinant, not a missed scoring. But most often you get single recombinants. And what you'll see is segments of the chromosome where you have a crossover, you have the other parental type, then you have another crossover, et cetera. Okay? Now, from that, we then evaluated that in six different environments uh, using, in this case, about 100 rills. So that would be more effective, or 100 rickles, which would be equally effective as probably close to 400 rill lines. So you can see the benefit of doing that. And when you look at this, there's a couple of things that are critical. This dark blue line is the overall analysis. So that's the mean of six environments um, and gives us the greatest precision. You can see there is one more peak which is barely significant, which would say, OK, we've maybe got two segments on this um, chromosome that are of, of interest. Now, the individual lines, um, basically are individual environments so that what you can see is here's one environment, here's two environments, here's a third environment, now here's a fourth environment. Now the reason why I want to bring this up is you can see that we had enough power, and this is often 
critical in, re, in uh, QTL mapping is enough phenotypic power to find things. Because again, remember, we're looking at a 15% difference. We're looking at it for yield. And the standard CV for yield is at least 8 to 15% in most trials. And the CVs would tend to be higher on these lines because the, um, the yield level is low. These are not our highest yielding lines. These are lines, Cheyenne was actually released in 1930, about 33, I think, Wichita in 1954. So it's amazing in a way that we had the precision to find these things within individual environments. Uh, now, the second thing is I wanted to show you is if you look at this, clearly that's a QTL in the brown. Clearly the red is a QTL. Clearly the green is a significant QTL. Ah, this one would be a non-significant QTL, wouldn't it? And so the light blue is, or turquoise, would be non-significant. Here it's not significant at all. And in this environment, it, you know, it's barely noise. And this is one reason why I really like the concepts of genomic selection is because this one is clearly, to my way of thinking, based on all of the other information we have marking a QTL, but it's statistically not significant. And so how do you take account for that? In statistics, you basically throw it away. But I think you can see that, in fact, it's just in this environment, it was important, but not significant. Now, OK. This is kernels per square meter. It's highly correlated with grain yield. What's interesting, as you can see, is that this one, which is barely significant for yield, for kernels per square meter, much more important. And again, you can see the other region still shows up pretty well there. 1,000 kernel weight. This region is much more important. This region is somewhat important, but not, uh, not nearly as important, actually, if you look as over here. So it ended up that we actually had a major region, which is here. This is the main one. But we had another region here. And then we had other traits related to grain yield over here, but actually not so much related to grain yield as the components of yield. Okay? And so in this, these regions, this ended up being um, what I would call uh, compensatory effects. And grain yield was only really found here and barely here. So now if you're going to come back and summarize, what you would say is it looks like we have mendelized the trait. That on this chromosome, there's one for sure and maybe two regions that affect grain yield. Now, again, we talk a lot about um, quantitative trait loci. And we talk a lot about G by E. So one of our questions was, how did this QTL relate to what we see in the field? And how does it relate over environments? And what you see is the Wichita allele, which is the purple blocks, versus the blue squares. Okay. The purple is always higher yielding everywhere along the curve than is the Cheyenne allele. Okay. And you're basically going from about one and a half tons per hectare to close to four tons per hectare. So that's a pretty good range. And that's you know what we see in yields in Nebraska, depending upon the season. And if you use the Wichita allele, you're never hurting yourself. You're only, at, at worst, you're no better, not much better off. And at best, you're significantly better off. This is sort of a breeder's dream. Because you can use the allele and never pay a price for it. It's always beneficial. And so that's a G by E interaction based on a change in magnitude in the differences. Now, the crossover interaction, which you can find, now this is for plant height, okay, uh, is completely different. In this case, you can see the Wichita allele is taller in the short environments. These would be the drought prone. And it's shorter in the tall environments, which is where you'd have more moisture. And the problem with this is, as a breeder, you would not know what to recommend to a grower unless you knew what the grower wanted and could predict the season. Okay? So I wanted to give you an example of the difference between a, a change in magnitude and a crossover or a change in rank um, 
interaction. And you can have both of those with QTLs, of course. Now, we then went on and said, you know, look, we've got big G by E. Can we try to describe the G by E? And in all honesty, this was fairly unsuccessful, but it taught us a lot about how to try to think about these things. So what we did is we broke the, the genotype by environment into three major components that due to temperature, precipitation, and solar irradiation. We then broke the growth and development periods into seedling emergence to terminal spikelet, terminal spikelet to anthesis state, and anthesis state to physiological maturity. Now, why do we worry about terminal spikelet? Because that's the stage which sets the maximum number of seeds you can have in a plant. That's when the spike is actually formed. It's, it's done very early. It's the double ridge stage and, and the like. Well, then what we did is we did a path coefficient, and we looked at uh, spikes per square meter, kernels per spike, 1,000 kernel weight, and how they relate it to yield. And you can determine which one was having the major component on it. Okay. Now, as you recall, because we were working with Cheyenne, Wichita 3A, the major component was, in fact, 1,000 kernel weight. And then you could look at the markers that were related to grain yield and see when did temperature have an effect. Well, temperature from terminal spikelet to anthesis had an effect on this marker. Uh, precipitation in that second phase had a... Um, had an effect on that uh, trait. The earlier temperatures had an effect on spikes per square meter. Okay, Then you could be looking at what happened in the later periods or, or other periods, you might say. What you'll notice is that actually nothing in anthesis to physiological maturity showed up in any of these uh, paths trying to explain the G by E. Now, the difficulty with this is that you explain very little G by E uh, with any of these paths. And so G by E is probably still the most toughest thing to work any kind of models for. And then the other part is, is this is really crude. You know, if you look at precipitation from anthesis to physiological maturity, it doesn't separate whether you had rain on the day after the plant anthesed and none till the finish, or if you had rain at the finish and not before. So there's going to have to be a more integrative way of doing that. Transpiration on a day-to-day -day basis would probably be a good example, but that's what you're going to have to look at. But at least, you know, it's a crude attempt, but it, and it gave us some insights, and we learned a little bit about how we would do it in the future. Now, the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the type of gene action. You know, we created hybrids so we could look at F1s, because that's the only way you're going to be able to see if heterosis occurred. So we actually made, you know, scale hybrids, enough seed. This is all done with uh, AgriPro Syngenta. And need to thank uh, people like Raleigh Sears and um, Rob Bruns and the guys. And they made these hybrids for us. Uh, so they made Cheyenne Wichita 3A by Cheyenne, Cheyenne Wichita 6A by Cheyenne, and then the Wichita similar hybrids, and then the Cheyenne by Wichita hybrid. And what we discovered is, first of all, we lacked power, because even though they made a lot of seed, we didn't make enough seed that we could really do multiple, multiple trials. And uh, we didn't have a lot of entries, you might say. But what we found is that none of the hybrids were significantly different from the midparental value, which would say additive gene action. And many of them were similarly not significantly different from the high parent, which said that they're there was no way we could see if there was really dominance. But everything kind of looked like it was somewhere between the midparental value and possibly, but generally not as, as high as the high parent. So if there was dominance, it was small, dominant genetic action, gene action, um, but looked like mainly additive, which is what weeds historically, uh, what we find in wheat. Now, the next question came up is, you know, you've got all this variation, okay? Have we used it? I mean, you'd kind of like to believe if you released a line in 1930 and you've got a line released in 1950 and you're now in 2000, that 50 years later we have incorporated that good QTL from Wichita. So what we did is we developed 
uh, we looked at the Cheyenne allele, we looked at the Wichita allele, and then we discovered there were new alleles, and we looked at a whole series of lines adapted to Nebraska. Now, what we found was the Cheyenne allele is still present in some of our modern wheats, and that had us puzzled. The Wichita allele was present, and that made us feel good because it meant our selection protocol allowed us to select for the Wichita allele. The new allele was not surprising only because you expect with the amount of germplasm we churn over that you should have new alleles constantly coming into your program. But why did the Cheyenne allele still exist with its yield penalty? So we looked at those lines carefully. And the lines which tended to have the Wichita allele were our irrigated, high-yielding lines in eastern Nebraska. The lines that tended to be modern that retained the Cheyenne allele tend to be adapted to western Nebraska. And what you see is the QTL in eastern Nebraska, or western Nebraska, had virtually no effect, so it's neutral. And in eastern Nebraska, where it had an effect, we were able to select for it. Again, now this is the map of Nebraska where we did our tests. Meade, Lincoln, Clay Center, North Platte. We didn't do any of the studies at McCook, one of our sites, Sydney, and Alliance. The big ones are basically Alliance, Sydney, North Platte, Lincoln, and Meade. Uh, Lincoln and Meade because they're so convenient. This is an annual water balance map, so you can see how you go from adequate moisture to a high plains virtual desert, you might say. Your crops go from corn in the east and soybeans to, in, in this district, into basically sorghum. And then in the far west, it's predominantly wheat. Where you can't grow wheat, it's grass pastures. Okay. Now, the next thing we did is we said we were interested in, in understanding how QTLs matched, where we got our germplasm from, and, and the like. By the way, the Wichita allele, if you want to know where it came from, it's in Turkey. Okay, And if you could see the fine print on that slide, you would see turkeys in the Wichita allele. So Turkey, which is the first Great Plains hard red winter wheat, actually carried the Wichita allele. Cheyenne, based on the markers, we had about 40 markers, is highly related to Turkey. It's a, a selection out of a sister line called Crimea, or a sib line called Crimea. The very strongly winter hardy wheat, Kharkov, is still related. And then I wanted to show you this line, Siouxland. Uh, Siouxland is highly related to Cheyenne, which explains that 0.4 coefficient of parentage between them by pedigree, and this is in fact by molecular markers. I should also mention that this slide is really looking at anything that's in blue is from the Nebraska or the Great Plains. Anything that's in black is from Turkey. And the idea was, you know, at one time the Turkish program was the source of all the germplasm for the Great Plains. We've now had 125, 135 years of breeding in the Great Plains. They've had a similar amount going on in Turkey. Could we go back to Turkey to get useful alleles that we may not be using? And so we did a genetic diversity study between Turkey and the US. What you'll see is that by and large, the Turkish wheats do cluster by themselves. OK, they're the black ones here. Interestingly, if you look at this, you'll see Wichita clusters with the Turkish ones. Doesn't cluster with the rest of the Great Plains. Okay. So that's kind of an interesting outlier. Okay? And what you also can find is there's a small segment of Turkish wheats which cluster right within the Great Plains. Um, these cluster with the older Great Plains wheats, uh, not the modern ones. And that includes a very famous Russian cultivar called Bezostaya. So you can use our molecular markers to begin to get an understanding of diversity. Now, where do we go from there? We have some current research, which is actually now pretty much finished up, uh, where we had studied the Cheyenne-Rickles 3A. 
And so we had the mirror image population, which is the Wichita Rickles for chromosome 3A. We're also developing a fine mapping population. Eventually, we'd like to be able to clone that disease, uh, gene. And we haven't made a lot of progress, but I really would like to look at the interaction between 3A and 6A in the Cheyenne background. If you want to look at it, there is some really good uh, data. This is from Ali's, where you can see how the segments transfer through. You can see where the grain yield segments are. And this is Ali's uh, paper, 2011, where we've added more markers. You know, the original paper did a lot with RFLPs. They got switched to SSRs, OK? And we've added more to it. And you can see how the number of markers and the marker density helped us understand things a little better. OK, looking at the Wichita Rickles, we can see, and, and this is something which is interesting to me, Wichita yielded about, you know, that's almost, that's almost 50 bushels. There's almost 60 bushels, OK? And if you look at this, we're looking at close to 550 kilograms per hectare less. That's three or four bushels less, OK? Uh, and in every experiment we've ever campaigned the substitution lines, we've always found the Cheyenne Wichita 3A is lower yielding than Wichita. Wichita, or Cheyenne Wichita 3A is always higher yielding than Cheyenne. And that's quite remarkable when you think of the environmental variation we have and the relatively small differences we're looking at these things, OK? And you can see, so we've, we've done all of the same types of things. And this paper, we hope, will be published shortly. Uh, uh, we've just submitted the revision. If you look at grain yield, now, we do correlations. Why? Well, correlations would show you if you have link traits. And it would also show you if you have pleiotropic traits, OK? Grain yields, 1,000 kernel weight. Again, that relates to the heavier seed. Kernels per spike, or kernels, or kernels per square meter. Spikes per square meter. Again, you can start figuring out what's causing the grain yield differences. If you look at new eyes data, it comes back to that central region in the chromosome. In Ali's data, the region down here was a little more important. Again, that's a Cheyenne, Wichita 3A. That had many more rills. That had over 230 rills, or rickles, I should say. So we had a much more precise data set. But in this data set, you can see, again, that central region becomes quite important. And what it says, OK, well, I want to show you one slide before I get to the conclusions. Maybe I should go back. Yeah, let's, let's summarize this. The position of the grain yield QTL located within a, simpler ma a similar map region as Campbell. So it meant that the Wichita Rickles were truly the mirror image of the uh, uh, Cheyenne Rickles. The minor QTL, which is, would have been down here, did not show in this part in the Wichita Rickles. That may just be a lack of power. And that the environment epistatic interaction between the QTL and the genetic background may be some of the reasons for this. You know, you don't necessarily expect everything in Cheyenne to show up in Wichita and vice versa. Okay? I don't know if you remember this chart from the previous one, but again, you can see that the Cheyenne allele in. Uh, Wichita tends to be lower yielding everywhere. And the Wichita allele, which is the, the diamond, or the triangle, tends to be higher, except maybe here, everywhere. What was interesting to me is I thought the yield would be greater at the higher yielding sites. If you remember, the separation of the Cheyenne allele from the Wichita allele is mainly in our high yielding environments. And in the Wichita background, the differences seem to be greater in the lower yielding environments. So that's something which we don't know if that's, you know, not sure how to explain that, to be honest with you. So what were our conclusions? Most of the QTLs controlling grain yield and yield components 
were localized in a cluster or two regions on chromosome 3A. The directions of their additive effects were consistent in the different environments, and that explained the genetic basis for correlations. The Wichita alleles in the previous uh, Cheyenne-Rickles 3A studies showed an increase in grain yield uh, in virtually all of those. And as expected, the Cheyenne allele reduced the grain yield in the Wichita background. And it was in the same region. So it's a very good validation of what our previous work had shown. There's lots of graphical tools to understand. This is CMAP. And you can see where our regions show up relative to other regions and how the markers all link together. So you can kind of look for markers. And, and uh, you can see that, that in many segments of chromosomes, actually, we're still missing polymorphisms. That's probably due to the relationship between Wichita and, um, and Cheyenne. You just weren't any polymorphics in certain regions. Now, one last thing that we need to look at is statistically we've talked about analyses of variance and things like that. There's one other test that we could use, and that's called a sign test, S-I-G-N. What it says is that if you flip a coin 21 times, you expect, on average, 11 heads, 10 heads, and 10 tails, 11 tails, something like that, right? So the question was, if Wichita had the infinitesimal model, then you would expect its chromosomes to be equally, well, it, let me go back. If you expected Wichita to have many, many neutral chromosomes, you would expect its substitution lines to have roughly as many above the line of, Wichita, of Cheyenne as below it. And if you count these up, you'll see that, in fact, there's one, two, three Wichita lines which are lower yielding. And it doesn't have to be significantly lower yielding than or what, three I should say three Wichita substitution lines that are lower yielding than Cheyenne. If you look at Cheyenne, there's one, two, three, four, five, six Cheyenne substitution lines that are higher yielding than um, Wichita. And if you do the sign test, what it says is that's a, not a random population around either the Wichita mean or the Cheyenne mean. So what that tells you is, in fact, the infinitesimal model may have a place. We know that, that Cheyenne was always less than the Cheyenne-Wichita 3A. We know that Wichita was always greater than the substitution line involving uh, Cheyenne, uh, Cheyenne 3A in Wichita. And it still is surprising to us. I mean, we've done that comparison probably in over 50 environments over the years. And we still have that. We still can find it. The infinitesimal model and the QTL model probably explain differences in this study. And the determinant was the power of the experimental design. And frankly, there's still lots of work to be done. And the last slide I'm going to leave you with is it's a very good quote by a former president of Harvard University. A good past is positively dangerous if it makes you complacent, content with the present, and unprepared for the future. And so I always think that as a student or as a researcher, this is what your guide should be. You can never be content. I mean, we've been successful breeding wheat, but I hope I'll be doing a better job when I retire than when I started. And I hope I will continuously get better as we do that. Then the last part is, of course, this is how you grow profitable wheat in Nebraska. It helps if you have an oil field underneath you. With that, I'll stop. Are there any questions? I sure don't see anybody typing. <laughs> Maybe that'll be handled in discussion later on. Is that right, Deanna? I'm I'm not sure if any if anyone has questions now's now's the time otherwise let's give Steve a hand and
If you guys need a second to think about it, that's fine too. You bet. I'll hang on for a bit. Yeah. Looks like a whole bunch of people are typing now. They're all saying thank you. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think of things, you can uh, funnel them through Catherine, or you can funnel them through Deanna, and or anyone else, and we'll be glad to do that. I hope you found it. Uh, okay, Young. What about the possibility of increasing yield in other cultivars? Okay. Uh, Margaret, the, the question that you're looking at, and I can show you that slide. Okay. This is the slide that gets right at that point. Because, first of all, here's the Wichita allele. And I meant to show you that, uh, let's see, where's Turkey? I hope I got it here. Yeah, it's right here. So you can see the Wichita allele probably came from Turkey. Now, would it raise in uh, yield in other cultivars? Well, probably, you know, well, let me come back here. Let's see. We should look for here. I want to see if we have Redland or Brule. Okay. Brule actually had the Cheyenne allele in it. That was a very popular cultivar in the West. The cultivar that replaced Brule is Arapaho. And so it actually is 50% Brule in its pedigree, but it did pick up the Wichita allele. From that, Culver, which is a Arapaho derivative, did very well. Harry is a very high yielding uh, line. Millennium is probably the next major line after perhaps Alliance. Now, Alliance was mainly grown in the West. But Millennium was grown across the, the state. So it looks like you know, the modern cultivars actually have done quite well with that QTL in them. And so the yield potential, we would say, is there. Now, has it worked in other programs? Well, the highest yielding line, I don't know if it still is, that Raleigh Sears ever had at Kansas State University, he said, was Ireland for just pure yield. That was one that was the best he ever had. Okay. So I, I think, and, and I, what I should also tell you is, is there's a, you know, I, I do work for the International Rice Research Institute because I'm, I'm on their board of trustees. And when they back cross in QTLs for grain yield into their rice lines, they were quite, you know, they were wondering whether or not that had an effect. And, and the answer is it did. They were able to transfer QTLs for grain yield uh, from one rice cultivar into another. Now clearly you can't do it if it's already fixed. So you know if I tried to you know back cross in, say the QTL into uh, New Plains or Jagaline, which is again a very popular Kansas line, it wouldn't it wouldn't work because it's fixed. Did that answer your question, Mary or Margaret? Okay, how does the new allele compare to the old allele, uh, the Wichita allele? You know, we really don't know. And that's, that's an interesting thing. And, and, but what I can tell you is that new allele came in relatively, you know, fairly long time ago. I mean, you know, if you look at it, uh, you know, here's some relatively new lines. Betty Akron, which is a great Colorado line. Niobrara was one of ours. Capitan's a fairly old line. Lancota was released in the uh, 1970s. And then Baca and Wahoo. I mean, those are all modern. Warrior, by the way, is probably, I think Warrior was the first line released of any significance by John Schmidt. He came to Nebraska in 1954. So there must have been, you know, again, we're constantly churning germplasm. It's not unexpected that you would have different alleles that, that could make a difference. Okay? And whatever this new allele was, was actually probably in our program. Warrior would be a pretty good indication that it had been in the program for quite a while. So Sue, did that answer your question? Okay. 
Well, we've probably taken everybody's time up. I'm, I'm thinking we were shooting for 50 minutes. Does that make sense? <laughs> so with that, maybe, uh, okay, I see David. In, uh, what sorts of technological tools were used in reaching the conclusions? Um, you know, basically, we did a lot of the mapping. You know, and that's mainly now based on SSRs. In the future, we're going to go to genotype by sequencing, it looks like. Uh, we also may use SNPs. I mean, that's, both of those will work. The uh, other technology would be the very good phenotyping. You know, that's our planters and our combines and our height measurements and those types of things. Uh, we've gone to alpha lattices so that we have pretty good statistical power. That's been a big advantage, especially when you're working with trials. You know, the, the trial by Ali, as I recall, had 240 entries. And you can imagine the spatial variation would be pretty rigorous on that. So I can't remember. I think we used I blocks of 5 or incomplete blocks of 5. We may have done an incomplete blocks of 10. So David, did that help? Okay. Sure, Dave. I think David was typing. I'm not sure. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> oh, David, that's a tough question. Uh, okay. Have you had any experience with phenotyping using canopy spectral reflectance or canopy temperature depression? We have not done the canopy temperature uh, depression. And I'm going to defer to Catherine to talk to you about canopy spectral reflectance. That's part of her PhD thesis. What I would say is that we're very fortunate, David, in that we have a group here called CALMIT, C-A-L-M-I-T, which is the Center for Agricultural Land Management Information Technology. And what we discovered was that they had set up a very good system for canopy spectral ref reflectance. So what we've done is they're lending us their machines. So uh, we're going to use a, you know, is it an Optiplex? I can't remember what the, uh, you know, the Ocean View or whatever the Jazz, the company that makes that. But they use a different one. So we're actually in the process of trading our Jazz in to get two of their other sensors. But Calmet has got that so that it's fully integrated into a software. And it looks like what we can do now is we can go out to the field. We can click on the plot, get a GPS spectral reflectance. I'm not sure if their equipment has in it the uh, canopy temperature sensor, but it may. And have it go from the machine to a laptop that will be sitting in the field. And then from there, we're going to upload it via satellite to have our data immediately stored. So it looks like a lot of the bugs that everybody else has been playing around with, we think we've got uh, part of that. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing that we really want to do, and i got to figure out, I don't know what the price is going to be, but it'll be pricey, is there's the same group, Calmet, has a plane which has a lot of sensors in it. And they believe that they could fly over our plots, which would be about 1,320 of them, as I recall, and probably take the data for you know, the GPS, you know, where it is, canopy spectral reflectance, and the full spectrum. And they probably could do that in two or three minutes. If that, in fact, works, then that is the high throughput phenotyping we would like. And that's probably where we would be coming from. 
That sounds like a good a topic for an, another seminar, Stephen. Uh, Arena has uh, one last quick question, and then I think we'll thank you for giving us so much of your time. She no, no she asks, how do you uh, how do you, uh, the future contribution of GS and plant breeding? Okay, um, we're just beginning to work with that arena. Where I think it's going to, I mean, first of all, my hope is that that'll be the way I'll retire breeding. Okay, I think it's the way I, intuitively it makes sense, that's the way it should be. Okay, now, um, where I really see it having a potential is we do a lot with our phenotyping, okay, but there's two critical junctures in my breeding program where I don't like the phenotyping, okay? And that's when I go to my preliminary observation trial, okay? So I go from about 45,000 head rows to about 2,000 plots, and um, what happens is that I'm seeing that only in, um, how do I want to put this? I'm seeing that only in one location. Now, the location I'm looking at it is in eastern Nebraska, and two-thirds of my wheat's grown in central and western Nebraska. So there's a real problem on, on how well I can phenotype there. That's one problem. And then the second thing is the field variation is large. The other is the next generation, which is the sort of the preliminary trial, but it's grown at nine environments, eight environments now this year, in an augmented design. And where I think genotypic selection or genomic selection is really going to help me is there's a comp sense, uh, comp the concept of replicating alleles, replicating over alleles as opposed to replicating plots. After that, I go to three replicated al alpha lattice designs. I'm very confident in that yield trial information, but I'm not nearly as confident that I can select in the preliminary observation trial or in the preliminary yield trial. And I do think genomic selection, where I'm now replicating over alleles to get a better estimate of allele value, where I didn't have those estimates of replicated plots, I think that could be very valuable. It, it fills a hole that my program doesn't fill now. And I think that's where the maximum utility will be. With that, I wish everybody well and, and thank them for your time. Stephen, thank you so much. This is a great start to our key TCAP seminar series, and we look forward to having another one uh, in the near future. Thanks so much. Yeah. Good luck now, students. Yep. Um, Looks like Dina chatted that you can feel free to join the Plant Breeding Training Network to get announcements on when the next um, seminars will be hosted. And you, you could also post any questions you have about this talk on the discussion board in the Plant Breeding Training Network, network and we'll make sure that those, those get to Steve. Um, to join the plant, how about all, all really quick um, show you where the site is, and if you have an account in the Plant and Soil Sciences eLibrary, then joining is, is just going to the page and clicking join, and I can show you how to create an account. Um,
Okay, for anyone who wants a quick walkthrough of how to join the Plant Breeding Training Network, I'll do that now for everyone else. Thanks, thanks for coming. Okay, so you should hopefully be able to see my screen. This is the Plant and Soil Sciences eLibrary homepage. And to create an account, you'll go to this login page up at the top or click on the home icon. It'll bring you here. And you can register for an account by clicking here. And it'll ask you to put in some basic information, um, name, institution, email address, and submit and a password will be sent to the email address that you enter and you'll be able to change that password once you log in and when you are logged in you can go to pastel.unl.edu slash communities slash pbtn plant breeding training network And if you are not yet a member, you'll see an icon here that says join now. If you are already a member, it will say um, unregister. Right here in the corner. And this is also where um, a copy of the recording of this webinar will be posted if you would like to refer back to it at some point later. Does anyone have any questions? You can also email me if you have questions about um, the e-library or about seminars. Okay, thanks everyone for coming.